What's up, y'all? I'm Michael, and this is the No Name Book Club. And hold up real quick. Come here. Can you see that? That white dot? That white dot right there? You can't see it? Of course you can't. The background is all white. But what if I put that same white dot against a dark black background? Can you see it now? Of course you can. Because what is whiteness without a larger blackness to compare it to? Toni Morrison explores this question and more in her 1992 book, Playing in the Dark, Whiteness and the Literary Imagination. And we're gonna be talking about this today. Rest in peace, Toni Morrison. Let's get started. Playing in the Dark is a book of literary criticism. So it's a book about books, but these aren't just regular book review summaries, okay? This is a little deeper than that. You don't necessarily have to already have read the books that are mentioned in a book of literary criticism. It helps, but it's not necessary. Literary critics ask bigger questions like, what does the book say about the time period it was written in? The author who wrote it? Or the audiences that really like that book? But not all criticism is the same. What makes Toni Morrison's criticism unique is her attention to the dynamics of power in the literary world. Powers in the spirit of gender, race, class, histories, and citizenship, and more. Morrison is asking a lot of questions, but she's not asking boring questions, like, are these books racist? Or is this particular author racist? Look, y'all, Tony's talking about a bunch of books where the white authors are throwing the N-word around like it's a basketball. Yes, it's racist, but we have bigger and better questions to ask, like, how do we describe this imagined blackness in the literary world? What uses does it serve for the white literary imagination? What tools are used to create and solidify this imagined blackness in the white literary world? And most importantly, what impact do these imagined representations of blackness have not just on black people, okay? We're not even gonna talk about black people, but on the minds of white writers, literary consumers, and citizens in general. All these questions to say, how is a fake blackness used to emphasize a small white dot? Tony tells us that in the world of American literature, the underlying assumption is that these American classics are race neutral or uninformed and unshaped by the 400 year old presence of first Africans and then African Americans in the United States. Tony tells us that it is impossible to separate American literature from the influence that the black presence in America has on it. Actually, every theme that we see in American literature, whether it's individualism or masculinity, community versus isolation, morals, innocence, death, hell, all of it is influenced by a dark abiding signing Africanist presence. Tony calls the study and origins of literary uses of this imagined version of blackness in the white literary imagination, American Africanism. Not African Americanism, American Africanism. Tony defines Africanism as a term for the denotative and connotative blackness that African peoples have come to signify, as well as the entire range of views, assumptions, readings, and misreadings that accompany Eurocentric learning about these people. Basically just how white people imagine black people in literature and what forces are influencing their imaginations. She calls these white imagined or non-white or African-like people Africanist. It's not really black, just black-ish. But that show wasn't around in 1992, so Tony says, Africanist. It's not important because the white gaze is so important or that the black gaze is more important. But we have to understand how a certain racialized hierarchy logic rooted in power and domination is normalized to a point where we don't even question it. The purpose of the book is not to focus on the main victims of racism, but rather the perpetuators of racism and asking how the doing itself of racism actually dehumanizes and hurts them too. As Tony says, the subject of the dream is the dreamer. Or as James Baldwin says, If I'm not the nigger here and you invented him, you the white people invented him, 
then you've got to find out why. The future of the country depends on that, whether or not it's able to ask that question. So why are these Africanist characters needed in the first place? Tony explains to us that the white literary imagination needs some kind of mirror. Deep internal self-reflection is scary and hard. So you need someone or some race to project your worries, insecurities, and fears onto. Sort of like when you critique your friends about their business, but you're really mad because you haven't resolved those things within yourself. And Tony tells us that these African, Africanist characters are being used for this purpose in books that we know like The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, To Have and To Have Not by Ernest Hemingway, and Safira and the Slave Girl by Willa Cather, and so many others. Author Lauren Michelle Jackson paints a more modern picture of this same concept in her new Vulture article, When Black People Appear on Seinfeld. But black people have never been non-existent or invisible in the white sitcom. They have been invisible only in the ways that black people who service the margins of white world making must be. In a genre whose conventions and hilarity thrive on white ridiculousness, black people, relegated to the smallest of parts, exist to reign in the free play of whites, reminding viewers how safely deviant the main cast can be. Tony tells us to look at the beginning of American history. What were Western Europeans running from when they came to America? They were running from oppression, tyranny, lack of economic mobility, no religious freedom, too much freedom or not enough law. To them, the new world meant freedom, a clean slate, power, control. Early American literary figures chose the genre of romance because it allowed them to work out their old fears and their new fears when they pulled up to this vast, unfamiliar new land. Fears of being an outcast, failing, boundarylessness, the fear of nature itself loneliness, and most importantly, the fear of freedom. So why romance as a genre? Because romance has all the tools for projecting your unresolved anxiety. Heavy symbolism, themes of self-valorization and validation, and violence. Romance offered writers not less, but more. Not a narrow, ahistorical canvas, but a wide, historical one. Not escape, but entanglement. <laughs> And luckily for these new writers, they just happen to have an entire population of enslaved black people to project all of that onto and drop them in their narratives. Black slavery enriched the country's creative possibilities for in that construction, blackness and enslavement could be found not only the not free, but also the projection of the not me. Bars. Tony tells us that in order for whiteness or even an American identity to exist, there needed to be some other to compare it to. If literary blackness could stand in for everything cruel, hypersexual, uncivilized, ignorant, weak, and vile, then nothing was left for whiteness and the American identity but strength, modernity, intelligence, and innocence. So this suffocates and limits the white literary imagination and white American identity itself because it never has to reckon with the insecurities and incapacities that continue to haunt it. White boys like Huckleberry Finn cannot grow into maturity and understand freedom without ignorant, unfree, black Jim. Freedom has no meaning to Huck or the text without the specter of enslavement. White characters in novels like Hemingway's To Have and Have Not and The Garden of Eden are blocked from their full humanity. White woman characters cannot access their womanhood without the imagined ungendered state of black womanhood. White men can never access twisted notions of manliness, sexuality, or a sense of superiority without defending the white woman from the savage, hypersexual black man. Even basic grammar is sacrificed for maintaining racist tropes. So in Hemingway's To Have and Have Not, they have this one black character, right? Who's silent the whole book. So there's this moment in the book where the character has to speak because they see something coming, but the author wants to make him remain quiet so bad that he does this syntactic gymnastics and forces the narration. So the white character does the seeing for the black character. 
The beep, nigger beep, was beep. still taking her out, and I looked and saw he had seen a patch of flying fish ahead. Brilliant satirical plays like the 1965 play Day of Absence by Douglas Turner Ward imagined the level of internal and external chaos that would ensue if white people were left to their own devices without black people or people of color to project their insecurities onto. Morrison makes it clear that literary blackness created by the white imagination has always been a reflection of white fears, insecurities, and unresolved anxieties. A pretty fitting quote from Britt Rennett's newest novel, The Vanishing Half, says this. Was this who counted for colored in America? Who whites wanted to keep separate? Well, how could they ever tell the difference? Morrison asks us a question. In what public discourse does the reference to black people not exist? It exists in every one of this nation's mightiest struggles. Then she lists them from the framing of the constitution to voting, public schools, legal definitions of justice, theological discourse, the insane concept of manifest destiny and immigration. We cannot afford to separate black people, poor black people, black women from these conversations. All of us, readers and writers, are bereft when criticism remains too polite or too fearful to notice a disrupting darkness before its eyes. Thanks for reading with us. I'm Michael. This is No Name Book Club. See y'all next time.